today's event uh, features Jessica Pierce Rotondi for her book, What We Inherit, A Secret War and a Family's Search for Answers, and Lauren Francis Sharma for her new book, Book of the Little Acts. Um, if you have questions uh, for the authors at any point today, please feel free to add them in the comments. I will uh, pass them along. I'm going to turn things over now to Ziziva's managing editor, Oscar Villalone, who will serve as today's MC. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Oscar. Evan. Well, thank yeah. you, Evan. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our authors. As Evan was saying, Jessica Pierce Pratandi is the author of What We Inherit, A Secret War in a Family Search for Answers. Joel Whitney, founder of Guernica, says of the book, recounting her family's heart-wrenching search for an uncle who was shot down during the secret bombing of Laos, What We Inherit is a triumph of investigative family history, a skillful and lyrical retelling of a mystery discovered largely upon her mother's death, this book is a reminder of how the suffering that remains after war, a secret war all the more so, can haunt us for generations. And Kirkus gave what we inherit a starred review, calling it an inspiring and revealing story. Uh, Jessica Pierce Bertandi's work has been published in Vogue, Salon, Atlas Obscura, and the Huffington Post, among other publications. And she was a senior editor at the Huffington Post. And she lives in Brooklyn. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you for having me, Oscar. Oh, no, thank you for being here. And Lord Francis Sharma is the author of Book of the Little Acts, and its starred review book list says that Francis Sharma offers fascinating characters across the broad sweep of the American continent at a time of great tumult, war and colonial powers, the spread of slavery, and expansion west. This is a compelling saga of family bonds, ambitions, and desires, all subject to the vagaries of powerful historical forces. And Lauren Vandenberg says, Book of the Little Acts is also the story of a young man's coming of age in a mother's secrets and family's, excuse me, in a family's love in the face of violence. This is the work of a major voice, a brilliant talent. Francis Sharma's first novel, Till the Well Runs Dry, was shortlisted for the William Soroyan International Prize and awarded the Honor Fiction Prize by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. She and her family live outside of Washington, D.C. Welcome, Lauren. Oh, thank you, Oscar. Um, I'll I'm sorry, yes, yes. Um, uh, I'll be popping back in later to moderate the audience Q&A. So those of you on Facebook Live, please do send us your questions for the authors. And remember, you can order copies of these books along with the books of all our authors participating in Lockdown Lit at Lunch on the Booksmiths website. So without further ado, I turn it over to Lauren and Jessica. Hi, Lauren, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm so excited that we got paired up to talk about our books today. Me too. I was wondering who paired us up because I feel like there was uh, there was so much like um, you know similar ties in these books, and so I was like, who I, did they read our books beforehand? And it was just like picked out of a hat. So I'm, I was super excited too. Same. I think we both take on very difficult and maybe darker moments in American history, and from multiple perspectives within one family to really show. Um, multiple sides of something that's often not even discussed in history books. So I think we have a lot to discuss today. Yeah, yeah, along with parental secrets, right? So yeah, many of those. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about, um, you know, if you want to actually just give us a little overview of like your book before we actually launch into sort of a, a deeper discussion. And you're going to see me press my, my earphones in like 8 million times because I'm trying to get the best sound here. So. But they're fabulous and pink and a good accessory as well. <laughs> in the age of masks, I find like accessories are all the more important these days. So like I really notice that it's beautiful. Um, well, the fact that your nails are done are impre is really impressive, I have to they're say. They're quite chipped up close, but from far away on camera, thank you. <laughs> uh, so What We Inherit is a deeply personal book and it begins in the wake of my mother's death. Uh, but when I uncovered boxes of declassified CIA documents and letters and maps that all pointed to a family secret, like we discussed before, and that was my Uncle Jack, who disappeared when his plane was shot down over Laos on March 29th, 1972, and just never came home. And the crash echoed what my family had already been through. My grandfather, Jack's father, uh, was a prisoner of war in Stalag 17, had parachuted out of a burning plane, was captured by the Nazis, and his entire family thought he was dead, but after three years in Stalag 17 prison camp, he walked through the front door again. So it was just so wild that his son shared his fate. And because my grandfather survived, he always believed that his son did too. And he spent the rest of his life looking for him. And um, after I found all these documents, I kind of recreated a trip my grandfather had taken across Southeast Asia to Laos. And the book is a mixture of 
family memoir. It's an investigative report about this war that left Laos the most heavily bombed country in the entire world. Um, and also an examination of what we inherit um, from our family and what we choose to do with that and how that could influence how we move forward in the world. Yeah, I really enjoyed reading this book. Um, I thought you did such a fabulous job uh, bringing in the story, um, not only of your uncle, but of your grandfather and even your mother's um, you know, continual search for her brother. Um, just really powerful stuff, really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing that. Um, well, I guess, you know, I'll tell a little bit about mine. My, my speech <laughs> about my book is never rehearsed, so I say completely different things all the time. But ultimately, um, it's set in the late 1700s um, and early 1800s and um, opens in what will become Montana here in the United States. Um, the main character of the book, uh, the heroine of my book is Rosa Rendon and she is from Trinidad. Um, and she's living in this uh, part of North America when the book opens. Uh, she's also got a son who uh, happens to be um, a part of a Crow Native American community. And he uh, is kind of going through his rite of passage, so to speak, and um, things don't seem to be working out. And something occurs uh, on, um, at the camp where um, a bit of a tragic event and she decides to take him away. Um, and essentially she, I, you know, for lack of a better term, she quarantines him <laughs> um, in her effort to protect him. Um, what she doesn't realize is that what he really needs is to know her story and know his history. And, uh, and so the story kind of goes back and forth between um, their two stories, along with one other character telling a lot about how she got there and what her life was like in Trinidad in the late 1700s when, um, when the British just took over the country from, um, from Spanish colonialism, so. Yeah, and I just loved the depth of your book. I mean, I don't know if you can see my reader copy is just covered in notes. There were so many quotes that I was just underlining and obsessed with, but uh, that just leads me beautifully into my first question for you, which I mean, so much of this book was about characters seeking a sense of home or a sense of homeland and the young boy, Victor, who is that teenager going through that rite of passage by the end of the book, he talks to says, Home was not one place, but rather it was one experience after another, one memory after another that left one feeling as if one had become more of who one was to become. And Victor understood he had been a fortunate young man after all. He'd been a young man of many homes. Yeah. And so many of your characters go from one sense of home, maybe an unsteady sense of home, to try to kind of seek and find closure in another. Can you maybe speak to the place that home um, and a sense of origin uh, comes through in your book? Yeah, you know, I think um, the book is ultimately about sort of home and community um, and building community uh, wherever you are. I mean, it opens um, with um, a black woman and her black son living amongst Native Americans, indigenous people who, um, who they don't belong to by blood, um, but they've become part of this community and, um, and very accepted part of the community. Um, but there is um, also, a, um, also a seeking as well. And I think that, um, you know, the seeking part is, is really the heart of, of, of this book. And, you know, this, this in, in essence, this sort of longing for, um, for belonging, uh, a full, whole belonging. And so Victor, um, I think, eventually comes to a point where, um, where he's um, decidedly confused. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, and, uh, and he doesn't quite understand why he's so different. Um, and I think we see also his mother experienced this as a young girl in Trinidad, also being a part of a community. Her mother is, um, is very feminine and very light skinned and Rosa is, um, is very rugged and, you know, a farm girl and loves the horses. And, um, and there's a lot of conflict between sort of, you know, gender roles and, um, and, this creates a sense of um, insecurity in her own home. Um, and uh, when she's seeking freedom, um, I think she's seeking freedom in many, many ways, um, both as you know, within her physical body, of course, and also this sort of emotional freedom that um, I don't think she was able to sort of capture um, even with the people who raise her and love her. So um, yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like with, with these, um, these themes of home, you know, you touch on it as well in this sense of 
bringing people along with you all the time. And, you know, your novel, so not novel, sorry, I'm so used to speaking about novels. <laughs> Your book so so vividly captures this idea of you know bringing the people that we love with us, and um, and always just trying to scratch I think beneath the surface a little bit to try to try to answer questions. I mean, we mentioned the whole parental secret thing, and um, and there are a lot of secrets in your book. Um, the biggest secret is sort of you know held by your mother um, who. You lost pretty early and um, who didn't talk a lot about her brother um, and you know in the opening scene you sort of reveal that you find this thing I'm, I'm so curious were you looking for those for that thing yeah so you know I lost my mother at 23 and, and she was the kind of woman I would talk to her on the phone every single night if you were reading a recipe book from her she'd have like you know marginalia about the proper oven temperature a way she would adjust it she was so thorough she wrote drafts of thank you notes for thank you notes so when she died I just wasn't prepared I, I wanted to know what she expected us to do without her my sister and I were just so bereft and I end up going to her closet which I think as a, as a daughter is kind of a place we gravitate towards right the first intimations we get of womanhood is maybe playing with mom's shoes or, or touching her clothing and instead of finding any notes or kind of open things from mom what I did find was this entire filing cabinet of declassified documents like like this one um, that talked about this brother that she never mentioned and there are just thousands and thousands of pages of them and for me you know while she was teaching me to stand up or sit or walk or drive she was carrying all the secret grief about a brother that she lost at the same age I lost her. So while I didn't get that direct message from her to me, what I got instead was almost a chance to meet her at my age and her grief and her journey through grief really became mine in some sense. Like understanding how she dealt with Jack helped me ultimately let go of her. Yeah, that comes through so much in, in the story, this deep love and commitment um, in your family, I found, um, it, you know, and I don't want to give too much away, but there, you know, there's a, um, there, everyone's taking this journey and, and much of it is centered around Jack, right? And there's this um, building on uh, one story on top of the other. So your, your grandfather is sort of the, you know, the leader, so to speak, of this, of this search. Um, and your mother finds herself also involved um, in trying to insist that, um, that, that Jack is is going to come home, that he might be alive out there somewhere and the government needs to help them do this. So there's a lot of sort of, you know, pushing up against um, the powers that be, so to speak. And, you know, I felt like, I felt like reading it, there was a um, sort of a, a communication um, as you're writing it. And I don't know, I don't think this happened in real life, but you know, this sort of call and response thing happening between your grandfather and you and your mother, um, you know, but Jack is obviously in, in the center of this thing. And, and I love the way, I mean, you, you know, I sent you an email and I was like, the structure is fantastic. <laughs> and so, and, but I, it was so seamless, right? And there's this sort of um, this back and forth of, you know, kind of showing what your mother did. I mean, she ends up going to Europe and your grandfather ends up going to Asia and you end up going to Asia and, you know, um, and, and this building the story on top of each other. And so I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about structure and, you know, I know that, you know, you and I share similarities in the structure. Very much so. So I've been working on this book for 10 years. And when I first conceived of it, I was still in my twenties. I was still very much that grieving girl. But I was also a journalist. I'm a journalist by training. Um, I used to run kind of the op-ed section at HuffPost. I now write for the History Channel. So I envisioned this book as a reported story on the war. But of course, naively, you can't really objectively report on something that is in your dead mother's closet, right? It's just not going to happen. And I think for me, <laughs> the moment where I decided to make the structure the way it is now, which is the morning I wake up learning my mother is gone, discovering these papers, and my grandfather waking up the day his son is shot down, and kind of traveling through his PTSD in World War II to this decades of, you know, more and more futile and angry and frustrated search in this David and Goliath battle against the government he once almost lost his life for and now no longer trusts this betrayal. And I decided to write it that way because I was going through all those papers and a piece of cold metal fell onto my lap and it was Jack's dog tags, which I didn't know we had. And when you hold something like that, it almost felt like like some, it's going to sound crazy, but like some kind of talisman, right? I imagined how my grandfather must have felt holding that object, how my mother must have felt 
holding that object. And to me, the story became not how can I tell the story of this war, but how can I make you feel what my family went through? And throughout the book, I include those found objects. So you'll see, like, this is one of the examples of the declassified CAA documents. There's maybe three words that are not right, barred with that, and so, yeah, yeah. You know, my grandfather, the truth about his son was right in front of him, but he could not see it because it was just barred by the very government he once loved and defended. So I wanted to kind of recreate that sense of suspense, um, but also make the reader really come along with me. And it wasn't so much about the answers as about the journey to get them. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, I, I, I was thinking about sort of the whole braiding narrative, right? And um, this idea that you... you, you um, you write your mother's story, you write your story, you write your, your grandfather's story in this really emotional way, one on top of the other. Um, and, you know, there, the only thing sort of missing was sort of Jack's story a little bit, right? I mean, and, and um, we know that Jack had a, um, you know, he re-enlisted and, yes. he went, you know, he went back in and, um, and, and so much of that seems to come from this desire to, um, to please his father, right? Yes. And, um, and, you know, you, you can't look at that and not recognize that there's a, there's a little bit of, of that in your search as well, right? In the search for Jack is this sort of, I'm doing this for my, for my parents. Um, so I, the commitment in this family is pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's both a, an act of love, but it also, I think, impacted how my family interact with one another. My grandfather says in an, in an interview, he, you know, he had four other children, uh, three of whom were in the military and then got pulled out because my grandmother said, you're never getting one of my boys back in ever again. Um, right. but, uh, he said, I, I was not really there for my other children, but I also just couldn't stop looking for Jack. And I think of my mother is the only one in her family to leave the small town of Pennsylvania where she's from. She was the daughter of the World War II POW who was paraded down Memorial Day Parade. She was then the sister of the missing boy. And I think when she moved to Massachusetts from Pennsylvania, she became kind of her own woman, kind of came into her own. I think she didn't tell me about Jack because she was in some ways distancing herself from that history. And the irony was, you know, the fact that she distanced me from it, made me want to identify with it, understand it all the more and brought me so deep into that part of who she was. Yeah. And your book does similar things too. I mean, it, it opens, I'm not gonna give things away because the characters are just beautifully wrought in how they interact with one another, but we have the narrative of you know two different people. And then we also have a third narrator and it's this beautiful diary entry that we're reading. So there's this kind of, much like I have found documents, we have this, we're actually reading someone's diary, which just feels so naughty and illicit, but also I just couldn't put that down. How did you decide to write the book with those narrative threads and write those together? Yeah, um, it, the book definitely started with um, with Rosa, and um, you know, in this idea that I wanted to write this story about this this girl who lives at a time when um, sort of inhabiting sort of the body that she inhabits is so um, is so dangerous, um, and being like being the kind of girl that she is is so dangerous, right? I mean, I mentioned that she's um, she's a farm girl, and um, and she loves this land and her father knows that she loves this land and he is very concerned about being able to pass this land down um, to someone in his family and she's sort of the rightful heir um, <laughs> but um but she's also a girl and um and there's so many impediments in addition to being black there's you know the impediment of her gender um where the, the law is literally preventing him from being able to sort of pass this down um and i think you know, that creates a, a real sense of injustice and pain that she herself, like your mother, um, tries to hide from her son many, many years later, this whole idea of, I'm just gonna leave the past to the past and let's just move forward. Um, and, you know, uh, what we don't often realize as parents is, you know, this, <laughs> this secret holding thing is, um, it, we think it's protecting our children, but very often it's um, it's keeping them from realizing their full selves and you know and grasping um, their connection to a deeper deeper um, place and different and different deep, deeper people and um, you know I just uh, I see so many it, it, I'm sorry and then you you mentioned the third narrator in the book um, is actually a, a character who I didn't intend. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> The narrator, um, he's sort of an outsider from this family and, um, uh, and, you know, her journey 
from Trinidad to Montana um, as a black woman requires that at this time requires a white presenting person, right? I like couldn't write this book and have her leave uh, Trinidad by herself because, you know, she could have been captured as, a, you know, as a slave, like there were just so many, like it was just too many pitfalls. So, um, so I sort of, you know, this character was going to be there, but I didn't necessarily plan for him to sort of take this huge narrative. But, um, but when you have a, a, a character um, that you want the reader to love and, and mm. attach themselves to, um, you have to handle, handle them with care. And if I was going to allow my character to leave her home country with someone, um, you were going to have to know this someone. And yes. so I found myself having to, um, having to sort of show you his heart um, through his diary entries, because he's not the kind of guy who's going to tell you all this stuff. So, <laughs> so his diary, entry, diary entries end up being really, really important um, to sort of build his character and allow him to sort of you know, grow and, and become a part of this family in, in ways that we don't expect. Yeah, and I think that's fascinating too. I mean, you mentioned he presents as white, his identity is more complex than that, but he's able to pass in this world. And he's also the one that gets to write his own history down. And I read an interview that you did in Lit Hub that was absolutely incredible. And you referenced a Hilary Mantel quote in which she says, facts are strong, but they are not stable. And your book is actually based on a real character. Edward Rose um, was a black skinned um, chief in the Crow tribe. And all the history as you were doing your research, it sounded like was written by white people that just didn't have the intimate experiences or relationships with him that you would want to know about, like the names of his wives, for example, or their stories. Uh, can you maybe speak to how the very fact of history having its own secrets and how you were able to delve into what was um, hidden because of who gets to write history and why you chose to write this book in that yeah. moment of time. Well, yeah, um, you know, I, when I was doing the research, I began doing the research, I, I found um, the first prime minister of Trinidad, uh, Dr. Eric Williams, you know, was an Oxford scholar and he left us with um, a number of books um, about Trinidad particularly, in, in particular, but then, you know, he has a couple that just kind of deal with the West Indies as a whole. And one of them is called Documents of, of the West Indies. And, um, and they're sort of just firsthand documents of letters that were written from colonists back home to Europe and, um, you know, sort of in the, um, the, the colony making time, so to speak. And what I realized going through it was exactly what you said, like there'd be a list <laughs> of people of color African slaves or free people of color and um, indigenous people and, but none of their stories were told. Meanwhile, I'm reading sort of all these men talking about how hot it is and how hard it is. <laughs> and, um, and so, it, you know, it became a little frustrating because it was like, well, there's, there's no record. There's no record. Um, you know, even if, if um, you know, even I knew that many of them were, were literate and I knew that many of them had lived these sort of, um, you know, slightly middle class lives. You know, some of the some of the um, the black free black people that lived middle class lives. Um, there were no there, there was nothing left of their stories, and so um, essentially, I I had to make a story and I had to create something out of the little bit of uh, history that I was able to find. And I wrote that piece in Lit Hub for the, exactly that reason, which is you know you know I love Hillary Mantel. <laughs> She's like a goddess, right? And I and I love. I love what she does with historical fiction, but um, but you know she's able to find all this all this information out about sort of Thomas Cromwell um, because Thomas Cromwell is Thomas Cromwell and he's white man and he's in you know in England and um, and I just had to wonder like how did how do you do that with characters who weren't seen as center the center of the world who weren't seen as the center of anything and so um, so I push back just a little bit on um, on this idea that you know that the facts are the facts, because sometimes the facts aren't even actually known and haven't even been sort of uncovered yet. You know, um, speaking of facts, with your story, I, um, there is this, to me, my, the, the, the most gut-wrenching part of your book um, was when your grandparents go to a, a hearing um, and the hearing is, is essentially, I, and I, I hope I don't give too much away, but the, the hearing is essentially you know, um, um, established a sort of 
declare your uncle as, as gone, as dead. And, um, and your grandfather and your grandmother get up and actually like give testimony during this hearing. And you found the transcripts and you built this in this, this, this hearing is built into the story and it is gripping. Right. I mean, like, I was like, Oh my God, did he really say that? I mean, it was terrifying and gripping and heartbreaking. Um, and I was just so fascinated by the, by the fact that you found this and you were able to sort of recreate this. Can you tell me about sort of uncovering that? Yeah, of course. I mean, so much of these boxes were newspaper clippings. So a lot of them were quoting my grandfather. He was the man in the family. He was the POW. So his photograph is in a lot of documents like this. My grandmother was only photographed holding signs and she was usually with her husband or they would say Mrs. Edwin Pierce, not even mention her name. And that transcript was the first time I got to see my grandmother's anger and, and also were eloquent. She was maybe five foot two. She was that, she was kind of a rounder lady. And so I think a lot of her identity was kind of this like motherly, um, kind of innocuous figure. She was a grocery bagger for most of her life. She never went to college. My mother was the first one in her family to go to college as a female. And in this trial, she is up against Air Force colonels who have the power to declare her son dead. These men with incredible educations, all these brass intimidating uniforms. And she walks up to them and just basically rips them a new one. It was just the research she had done. I have her notes for the things she was practicing. She took you know, thousands of pages of documents that she had gotten herself in the 70s that were still classified, done her homework, and basically made them apologize to her as if they were children. And it was just such a striking moment of victory and yes for me, because I got to hear, it's a transcript, so I actually got to hear her voice on this topic where, you know, by the time I got to know her, she was kind of more in the dementia stages as well, which added another layer of difficulty to the story. But seeing them come alive again in that way showed me the possibilities of being able to write them as kind of living characters, if you will, in my book. So a big decision also in making my grandfather a standalone figure and my grandmother too was, so you could hear them. I didn't want to be like another journalist kind of giving you my opinion of them. I wanted them to kind of come through on their own. And that's definitely a scene where that's all them. I barely wrote anything. It, it literally was transcript. It was such a goal to find. No, no, no. There was so much craft in that. There was so much craft there because you had to build the tension and there was, you know, this panning out that you do. And I, I really enjoyed the, the work that you did in that and appreciate the work that you did in that. Um, well, it opens too. Like my grandfather says, I was a prisoner of war. I was shot down in 1973. as was a prisoner of war until the 1940s. And his wife corrects him. She's like, he's blending his son's life and his together. The two are so... You can just tell his mental state at that moment because he's just so frazzled. They've been driving overnight. And, and my mother got married a month later too. So I look at my mother's wedding photos differently now that I have that transcript. It's just amazing how the larger moments in history and looking at the timelines of my family, how they intersected and it just illuminated a lot of things for sure. Yeah, I found that too when I was, um, when I was writing. It's so easy to sort of... Um get caught up in sort of the the immediate narrative and the minute you pan out you realize there's so much more going in going going on here um you know for for me um i opened the book in 1796 and it is the year before the british actually arrive on the island and so i sort of show you what life is like looks like you know before when the spanish kind of controlled things but they have such a loose control i mean the spanish took over trinidad um after hundreds of years of warring with indigenous tribes and um and they thought they were going to find gold on this island and they you know they're sort of like ah there's no gold here what are you going to do with this island ah, you know and so <laughs> they sort of loosely control it until they decide oh right we can do you know cocoa and um and then no one wanted to come to the island. So, you know, they sort of sought out um, neighboring islands to see if some of the inhabitants would come over. And most of them were sort of um, um, Frenchmen or French, you know, colonists. And so, um, so the island ended up sort of being French speaking. And, um, and then, you know, there's all this warring happening in Europe. Um, and, you know, I'm so focused on Trinidad that I'm not quite realizing what's going on in the outer world. And when I pull back, I'm, I'm like, oh, right. You know, there's this revolution that's happened in Haiti, which mm -hmm. is having real serious um, effects on the stability of continuing slavery, right? And Europe is, Europe is very concerned that like 
you know, enslaved people are going to continue to revolt. And the, the Haitian Revolution was so brutal and so scary to Europeans um, that it sent sort of waves, ripples um, down the entire Caribbean. Um, and so when I started to pan out, I realized, oh, all this is happening when my characters are living, right? They're living mm. under this constant threat of change, um, this, you know, sort of news trickling in. And, you know, what does, this, what does this all mean for our lives? And, you know, the English rule very differently than the, than the Spanish, um, which they come to learn in 1797, you know, when the English finally arrive. I mean, it's sort of a slow taking over, but when they finally come in, it's sort of like, oh, you, 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 you free people of color, you think you can own businesses and you think you can own land? Or, mm, not so sure about that. So everything kind of goes up. Um, and, and become so unsettled. And just imagine living at this time when you think that you're sort of accomplishing something and you, you know, you're, the threat of slavery is always sort of at the back of your, right there on your shoulder. And then this, this new power comes along and they can change all the rules overnight. And so I try really hard, I tried really hard to sort of build um, that tension with it. But, um, but the, the sort of idea of, of the, the outer world kind of bearing down on your characters is so important um, for the tension building um, in fiction and in your case, it's really happening. Um, which sort of brings me to my next question, which is, um, you know, and you mentioned this about betrayal and um, your grandfather um, was in the military, he was a POW. You had two, three uncles, three uncles who served in the military. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and Jack is, Jack goes missing. And, um, and there is this incredible sense of betrayal um, that your family feels about the government and the, and the secrets <clears throat> and what they won't tell them. And, um, you know, Laos becomes huge at this point because, you know, there's um, you know, we, we as Americans don't realize what's been happening in, in this part of Asia. Like we know about Vietnam, but what's going on in Laos exactly. And so, um, and so I found myself completely like taken by this, by this part in your book. Um, but, but, you know, I was thinking about sort of, you know, um, the English coming to take over Trinidad and, and, you know, my characters are, um, are feeling very insecure, but they also have no expectation that mm -hmm. the government is going to protect them in any way. Whereas your family, you know, is, was a part of the government, so to speak. Your father, your grandfather was actually even a, a, a police officer, right? And there's this, this belief in, you know, in American exceptionalism, I imagine, and, and, and all that, you know, we Americans tell ourselves about America. And then this thing happens. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I know it, it might be a tough question to answer, but I'm, I'm <laughs> a tough question, but I'm just, um, I'm just curious about like what that does to you. What do you think it did to your mother? Just the whole idea of this, um, this sort of this, this ultimate betrayal. Yeah. I mean, and I, first I will say it is an incredible privilege to feel protected by the police officers or to feel part of that power structure. It's not something that everyone in our country has right now, for example. Um, and I think for my grandfather, especially he, he retired from the Pennsylvania state police. He called them his brothers. And there's this incredible letter where he resigns saying you, you have betrayed me true. Um, it, it was just, you know, when he was shot down from that plane, he saw many people die all around him. He saw men commit suicide in the prisons. He just saw so many people go through such horrible things. So when he came back, I think to maintain the idea that that was worth it and that was something that was right and that was good, you know, his medals are on the wall. He's being marched in these parades. There's this, re this reinforcement of um, if you do hard things, you'll be rewarded because you're ultimately doing it for a cause that believes in you and supports you too. When his son was shot down over a neutral country, that the United States bombed every eight minutes, um, every eight minutes, uh, 24 hours a day for nine years. We dropped two million tons of bombs over this country and it wasn't even an active uh, combat. It was just such a different conflict. And the minute the Air Force knocked on his door to tell him his son was missing, they told him he was shot down in Thailand, but my grandfather knew that we were in Laos. And he said, you better get me some real answers sooner. I'm gonna take this to the press. And that's exactly what he did for the next 36 years. Um, unfortunately, because of Vietnam, because of Cambodia, there were so many other big things. Because of Watergate, um, people kind of were never really listening and they just kind of stopped listening. And that was a silencing of someone who was used to being 
heard. And every time he was on a parade platform or given this position of, okay, POW, can you speak to your experience? He would get up on the platform and have the flag, but he would also have this POW MIA flag and talk about his son. And not anti-government necessarily, but question and kind of undermine this, this idea that the country that we're serving is giving us the truth. And I think that was heartbreaking for him, but also something that deeply informed how my mother raised my sister and me, like the act of questioning. You can believe in something and love it, but also don't believe everything you hear. Um, there are 13 declassified reports that my uncle was alive up until 1986. There's one that says he was like dragged behind a truck. There was one that said he was killed upon impact and uh, the government hid every single one until they kept looking for it and found it. And a lot of that was banding through other families um, from many different backgrounds. And that was kind of an interesting thing too, to see which families got which information, but through the virtue of being citizens and banding together, they were able to take on these larger authority figures and ultimately get some answers. Yeah, wow, yeah. Was, but, was dark. <laughs> Sorry, it was a long answer. No, it was great, it was a great answer because it really, um, really highlights so many points in the book where um, there's so many turning points in the book and all those sort of um, re revelations of the, of the documents are sort of come and they come very slowly, right? And so, um, and there's lots of twists and turns and, you know, and it does sort of bleed into this idea that, um, that and continue to, to give your grandfather hope, um, you know, with every new bit of information that you find out about the possibility that there, you know, that there were men who walked off of that plane alive. Um, and you can see why he held on so, so fiercely, um, you know, it, it totally made sense to me. Um, I'm curious about that, that question, uh, that answer you gave of, uh, sort of about questioning things and whether you think that led you to your, your career now. Yeah, I mean, as a journalist, like my, my job is to ask questions. Um, when I was an undergrad, I got this really awesome grant to do an oral history project on World War II. And I didn't just interview male veterans, I interviewed female veterans who were breaking Japanese codes. I, I interviewed this gentleman who was Japanese and was deeply, deeply like discriminated against during the war. Like things were thrown at his house, his family was threatened, but he also served and he came back after World War II and was treated differently than the people he had served with. And I wanted that story reckoned with as well. I, you know, and writing for the History Channel now, there's an incredible responsibility. What are the stories that make it to history books and what don't? Uh, in my high school, I never learned where Laos was on a map. We didn't cover the Vietnam War. It was something we studied on our own time before the AP exam. And I think that's a problem that the historians of our generation and the journalists of our generation are working actively uh, to correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thank God for writers, right? <laughs> <laughs> the feelings that we're going to tell you about them. <laughs> yeah. And speaking about like kind of who owns the narrative and who owns history, I mean, this book takes partially part in the American West. And, you know, typically when you think of a Western, we think of the Zane Gray books of the 50s, or we think of John Wayne on his horse doing cowboy things, right? But in the past 12 months, there have been some incredible books that don't just tell us that white male Western perspective, right? We have um, How Much of These Hills is Gold, which is a book about Chinese immigrants during the gold rush in California. Uh, by C. Pam Zane, we have Taya Obrick's Inland about a frontiers woman and an immigrant coming to this country and Book of the Little Acts. Tell me more about, were you conscious of writing against that Western trope and tradition and how much did that play into how you um, chose the characters you chose and told the story that you told? Yeah, um, yeah, so very conscious. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wanted to, I did want to write a Western. Um, you know, this book actually um, popped up um, in my mind while I was listening to Willie Nelson on Fresh Air. Um, <laughs> it's the strangest thing. And, um, and I was sort of like, what's happening here? Um, but um, so, it, you know, I knew immediately, I mean, with Willie, like playing his, you know, his guitar, I was like, I, I'm somehow writing a Western, but I have no idea what that means. Um, and, you know, I grew up with, um, with West Indian parents and um, West Indians of a particular age are, uh, are nuts for country Western music and Westerns. And, um, and so my, my home was sort of filled um, with, with that. So I was super familiar with the idea of sort of the lone guy and up against the land and, you know, <clears throat> all that Westerns mean for, for Americans in this country. And, um, and I knew that, um, that I wasn't gonna write that story. I knew that my, um, that, that, that my, my story was gonna be about community and, um, 
and that it was going to be about community with not only other individuals, but also with the land, right? And it wasn't going to be um, a resistance, uh, a, you know, resistance to, to those, those usual um, things that, that like we think of as sort of the white male um, impediments, you know, the land is in my way, these people are in my way. And so, um, so I wanted to write a very different story. And I also wanted to, when I found Edward Rose, who you mentioned, um, I found him during my research and I was sort of like, wait, there's a black man <laughs> in the, on Bighorn Mountain and he, you know, he's part of the Apostolic tribe. It was like, that is, you know, just amazing. Um, and I sort of knew then that I, you know, I had an anchor for this, this character. I mean, there was such fluidity um, during this time. There were people um, sort of moving from place to place, even though it was hard travel, right? And we know this um, because there have been books and lots of things written about men doing this. And, um, but men don't go alone. Babies aren't born alone. So. <laughs> So we know there have to be some women uh, around. Um, and so there was all this sort of, you know, I, I wanted to write a story, um, a Western, and I wanted it to be a woman, and I wanted it to be, in, you know, a, a story about community and, um, and finding freedom, but in a different sort of way. Um, and, you know, I, I, I was at a, a writer's retreat um, that shall not be named. And um, I was on coming out of dinner on the porch and I was sort of like on my way back to my little cabin and I got stopped um, by someone who's, you know, sitting with his glass of wine and he's sort of like, hey, you, hey, you know, tell me about this, this, you know, this little story that you're writing. And, you know, I was sort of like, well, you know, I think I'm writing a Western. And, um, and, you know, he turns to me and he's like, do you even know what a Western is? And he starts asking me if I've read like, you know, all these, you know, old famous Westerns, you know, in the Western tradition. And I was like, I mean, yes, I had, but I didn't even realize what was going on at the time. I was sort of like, yeah, yeah, I read that. And yeah, I read that too. And, and, and as I'm walking back to my cabin, I realized, wait a minute, is he asking me if I can, and if I'm allowed to write this and, and, you know, it's completely spurred me on. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a former lawyer, so I'm super competitive, <laughs> super yes. competitive. So, um, so like the last thing you need to do to me um, is to say that I can't do something and I'm just like, oh, I'm going to do this. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so the story really, um, I think got a little, uh, got a little fire, you know, mm. there. I, I felt like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm doing. Um, and I don't even know if I, if the, when the story came out, if I was fully, fully aware yet. But, um, but that certainly helped me form this idea that I was writing against and with, you know, this Western tradition. It's true. And I had a slightly similar experience. I was you know, pitching this book out to a lot of really amazing editors in New York whose work I had loved. And a lot of them were female too, but a lot of the feedback was, well, women who write books about war, those, those books don't really sell. Maybe you can make it like a cancer memoir instead of also making it about this war. It can't be a war and a memoir at once. But we have such, you know, publishing as an industry um, lifts up some incredible stories, but it also, to even sell your book, you have to have these comp titles. So my book is gonna work because it's like this thing that's worked before. And when you're trying to do something different or outside the lane, uh, it, it is challenging to get it told, but I'm just, I'm so grateful that we kind of stuck it to those people that told us we couldn't do it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, you know, I have um, one last question um, that I'll ask you, which, you know, might be a little controversial, so you don't have to, like, you know, fully dive in if you don't want to. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I, as I was reading, I was sort of bracing myself, right? Like, you're, you are a white woman, you're kind of going into Laos, and you're trying to find answers about your uncle, who is, you know, a part of the U.S. government, so to speak. And there's so much there, right? I mean, there's, um, there's sort of, you're, you're walking in and you're asking people to help you un uncover the truth about this, this war that's really hurt them and, yeah. um, and damaged their country. And, you know, and, and so I was reading and I was sort of like, oh, how is she gonna do this delicately and still honor the space that she's in and, you know, and, 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 and give, I'm right about the people that she's meeting in a way that's not, you know, not a trope and not stereotypical. And I think you did that really, really well. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if that was 
conscious, if you were thinking about it um, as you were writing those scenes, um, you know, and, and how you were going to, 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 to sort of honor all of those various spaces that you were inhabiting <laughs> as you're uncovering the story. And I, you know, and I was sort of thinking about it in terms of, you know, um, what I just mentioned about sort of my character going into a new place as a, as a woman, as a black woman, and, you know, and for you, you're a white woman, you're American, and, you know, there's, that comes with so much, that comes with privilege, but it also comes with like some impediments to finding answers to, so. No, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, and it was something that wasn't only on my mind when I was writing it, but it was just such a presence throughout my entire trip in Laos. You know, my uncle was part of the forces that were making this the most heavily bombed country in the world. I went to the village and he was bombing and I'll never forget it. I, I saw this laundry line hanging in front of a house and there was a little boy Superman pajamas. And we think of Superman as this American hero, he's saving the world, but the laundry line was over a bomb crater left by American bonds. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the, the entire time I was there, I, like, do I even have a right to be here? What right do I have to ask these questions about their lives? And I think the moment that the book also transformed for me, I go to this place called the Cope Center, which is dedicated to helping people understand the legacy of the American bombings. And you walk in this hangar like an Air Force kind of hangar, and there are prosthetic limbs dangling from the ceiling made for the bodies of children. And 50 of them a year are still dying from the American bombs left in the soil half a century ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a quarter of the population became refugees. And like the, it, it's just so many things for generations were set in motion because of this war. And my uncle was an agent of that. Like I, when I was looking at those prostheses, there was a video playing on loop behind me of an AC-130 plane, just like his swooping in and killing a brother and sister. And it's a brother and sister. My book is about a brother and sister. Mm -hmm. But the two things can be true at once. I can have compassion and feel the pain of my family for losing a child, but I can also understand that child grew up to be a man that did things that hurt other children. And I wanted the book to not just be a oh, woe is me, yeah, America story. I wanted it to be the story of this war won against incredible odds and at great cost by essentially a freedom movement. Um, you know, the Lao people won the war and beat the Americans back. And there's also museums I go to in the book about the American imperialists that kind of discuss their side of the war. You know, I grew up with images of Vietnam and protesters in the US, but there are Vien Chen college students um, kind of holding up effigies of Kissinger as well. So it was almost like college students around the world fighting against the same force, but we're not allowed to see it in our media. And you can be killed or imprisoned for talking about the war even today in Laos. So it's a privilege to be American and get to come back to my country and write and publish a book about this time in history. So while my gender and my Americanness, I, I think at times perhaps I was taken less seriously and less of a threat, I could perhaps move more freely in the country because I wasn't considered um, I didn't look like a journalist, I looked like a tourist, perhaps. And that, that was kind of how I, the vibe I got from a lot of people I was interacting with, including my tour guide. Um, but one of the more magical moments of the book, at least for me, my tour guide has no reason to love me, given my background, given what's happened to what I later found out about his family. But there was a moment when we come together over something that happened to our parents' generation. And that was a moment that I, I will never forget. I'm still in touch with this person because it, history becomes real when it becomes personal. and. I see, I, my goal with this book was to not just tell my family's story, but to really put information about the war into this context and let other people write more books about it, hopefully. Yeah, you did a great job. You did a great job. <laughs> I know we should, should we open up for questions from the audience. I know we're yeah, about to. I don't know. I, let's see. Yes, we may. Um, let's start with a, a question from Leslie. Um, uh, Jessica, was your grandfather living when your mother passed? And if so, did you delve into his memories of his, uh, yes, and son and, and research? Yeah, so my grandfather um, had passed away a year before my mother's cancer diagnosis. So he um, was not alive when she passed. But when I was in seventh grade and probably too young to appreciate it, I had recorded my grandfather's stories about World War II. So there's the shaky tape of him describing parachuting out of that plane and, and his World War II experiences. So my grandfather and I never had a single conversation about Jack, but we did have were these World War II memories. And I really think going through these documents was kind of a conversation we never got to have in many ways. Um, I was wondering too, if we could delve a little deeper into 
your insights, both of you, into how intimate stories of families help us make sense of the history of empire and war. And what I was thinking specifically, uh, was there something in the writing of your books that may give you some insight, especially into the ways in which societies handle ugly truths, long hidden, but not widely revealed? Lauren, do you want to take it? Oh, yeah, I, okay. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, and, and Jessica sort of said it, right? I mean, when, when, the, when history becomes personal, uh, you know, it, it, it really opens up. And, and, um, and I think framing um, these stories um, around, we know this as storytellers, like framing the story so that people are um, emotionally attached and become and get to know characters and people intimately um, is sort of how we open up a conversation about things that um, that have been hidden. And so I think Jessica did that really well in her book. I too, you know, I brought up um, <laughs> lots of stories about sort of <clears throat> the slave trade and the triangular trade and um, the impact of colonialism on this really tiny island and then again, the impact of colonialism on, on, you know, on what will become America. Um, and in my story, history is sort of following my character, despite, you know, her trying to run away from it, it's literally creeping right behind her. And I think that, um, that the, the reason it becomes an active agent in the story is because I, I'm framing it um, within this character, or these characters that I hope um, readers will love. And, and want to protect. Um, and I, I think I answered a little bit before about exactly what you said. I, the task of a writer who's writing about a difficult part in history is to not make it comfortable. I think it's to make it maybe actually as uncomfortable as possible. And there's like two ways that can go. You can sit with that and put the book down or you can keep reading and then go on to further sources. I think I meant to mention earlier too, um, you know, before the Americans came to Laos, it was the French. And before the French, it was the Thai people going back thousands of years. And the Americans actually exploited um, different groups that spoke different languages that had different ways of life and different ways of being. So now that there is, there are so many um, Hmong, particularly in the United States, Hmong was not originally a written language. So a lot of the stories about the Hmong that we know, I think the most famous is probably The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down by Anne Fadiman, a beautiful book, but also written by a white woman. And I think now we're starting to see the stories of the grandchildren of those refugees who are asking their parents and their grandparents uncomfortable questions. What beautiful one is um, Late Latecomer by Kao Kao Liang. It's a tribute to her grandmother who escaped all of that. But I, even the privilege of writing in a language that is the language of your grandparents is not something that a lot of human beings on planet Earth have, right? And so I, I think it's also just conscious of who's telling the story and the responsibility if you're not of that group. Um, to take that responsibility very seriously. Yeah, yeah there's, I, you know, what, what I find so uh, interesting about your conversation is how, you know, uh, the sort of uh, parallels that can be drawn from that um, in terms of our current situation right now. Um, is, you know, so much, I mean, I'm thinking here again about family histories, um, just as there are so many things that families aren't willing to talk about and there are divisions that'll crop up because someone wants to bring to light something that they know is problematic or is something that they at least think should be talked about. It could create these, these rifts. And uh, I was, so I was just, uh, I guess, you know, I wanted to, you know, just to ask you again, that, you know, do you, some, do you see something in the terms of the way you're, uh, uh, you know, in, in this case, Les, uh, Jessica, with your story of your family, and, and, uh, and, and in the case of the Book of the Little Acts, about how those family dynamics manifest themselves in society at large. Yeah, um, <clears throat> for me, um, you know, Rosa is taking her, um, her son out of, from a situation that has occurred at a camp that um, that she feels is dangerous for him and she feels is um, is harmful to to his emotional well-being and you know I, I think a lot about um, about sort of her 
taking him away in the middle of the night um, to protect him in. And I think about, you know, what my children are, um, are living through right now. And, you know, I, I wrote this piece um, in The Lily um, a couple, couple months ago about sort of believing that the quarantine would actually um, protect my children from sort of the, the, you know, the nastiness of racism and um, <laughs> not realizing that upstairs in her room, my, you know, 13 year old was watching George Floyd die on the phone that I, you know, mm. forgot to put the parental screening on, you know, and, um, and not only had she watched George Floyd die, but then when they showed that on whatever it was that she was watching, they actually showed all the other things that I had kept her from, all the other deaths that I had kept her from for years. And, and it was just wrenching for me as a parent to, to <laughs> you know, have that one moment of sort of parental neglect um, end up sort of being um, the, 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 the wall breaking between sort of, you know, this, um, this protection that, um, that I was trying to put up for them. Um, and so, you know, the whole idea of, um, of, you know, parental secrets and protection and, you know, resonates a great deal for me today. Um, and, uh, and I don't, I don't know if there's ever going to be a time when parents aren't doing what we're writing about, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Right. And I, I think in my family's case, you know, coming from a military family, um, we almost are the aggressors, right? And, and not talking about that part of American history and the heritage too. How are we not doomed to repeat the same attitudes? Uh, so I, I think in that case, the family secret and wanting to make it safe or polite or okay, um, it prevented my generation perhaps from being able to make peace with it. Obama was the first president to go to Laos and we were bombing it in the 60s and 70s and it just, uh, it shouldn't take 40 years for something like that to go unacknowledged and to have a sitting American president go to that country and start that dialogue anew, I think opened the doors for a lot of us to come forward. And the CIA is still holding a lot of classified documents about this conflict. They're starting to be released. It was really the first time uh, the CIA was militarized and I think a lot of what they learned there was then carried over into Latin America and to the Middle East. So uh, history is never just this dead secret that you can bury. It's something that I think very much lives within us and influences the generations as they come forward. And it's really refreshing and hard, but refreshing to have these kinds of dialogues now, um, especially in quarantine where we have a lot more time to sit and think our thoughts and come to terms with maybe some more difficult things. Right. Well, uh, Lauren and Jessica, thank you so much. Uh, for yeah. this conversation and thank you so much for your books um i'm now going to turn it over to uh, evan thank you so much oscar as always um and thank you lauren and jessica this has been a wonderful conversation um congratulations to you both on your books um, thank you thanks very much thank you t for hosting us at booksmith really appreciate it and um and lockdown lit <laughs> <laughs> For sure, for sure. Our, our love for that group is, you know, is un, un, unbound. So, yeah. For sure. It's been a, a beautiful series so far, and it, and it is ongoing, uh, everybody. Uh, Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, you can find a full list of authors' upcoming events and watch uh, past Lockdown Lit events at um, booksmith.com uh, slash lockdown um, uh, dash lit. Um, Thank you again for joining us today. You can you can get um, uh, both Lauren and and, uh, and Jessica's books, um, uh, Book of a Little Axe and What We Inherit from Booksmith.com, um, and uh, there, there they are, beautiful. Um, uh, I encourage you to do that, and uh, we'll ship them right to your door. So um, thank you all again for joining us. Have a have a great day, and um, hope to uh, to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.